Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I'm Peter Engelman, the president of the society. So tonight we are here um, to have a reading of a selection of Hassel family letters from the uh, second part of the 19th century. Um, the, the mastermind behind the program tonight, uh, Jennifer Hassel Kaliski, who's a Hassel family member, can't be here. Um, she came down with a cold, has laryngitis. Um, but the show goes on, even without her. Um, we have, what do I call you, the Kanma Historical Society players? <laughs> They're doing their debut tonight, one night only. Um, and Mary Irwin is going to give us uh, some introductory information about the letters. The Hassel letters are a big part of our collection here. They're probably maybe the largest manuscript collection we have. Um, there's hundreds of family letters. They're really uh, quite an incredible trove. Um, Andy, thank you for giving a lot of them to us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I went looking for them and I couldn't find them, so I said, well, I hope I gave them to this Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and the cases over here, Mary will say more about this, but the cases have some of the letters and other information about the Hassel family. The flyer also has some good information on it. So I hope you enjoy the show. Um, Mary Irwin's going to come up and share. So as Peter said, the Hassel family paper letters are among our most important manuscript collections. They really tell a story about a time of great change in, um, in New England when people moved off of family farms, went to work in factories and explore the country. It's the age of exploration. A lot of people moved to New York and went Midwest, further west. Um, some of the letters you'll hear read tonight are displayed in these two cases along with some additional materials related to Joseph Hassel when he founded the town of Hassel, Montana. And over in the first display case over here, we have um, materials that relate to the Delabar and Hassel family. And the reason the Hassel family, so many of them, ended up in Conway was because Maria Hassel married Edward Delabar and they built, he, built, he owned the mill, the big woolen mill, and they had lots of children. So, I, oh, I better say something. So Jenny is really d upset that she can't come tonight. She has laryngitis of all nights to get it. She has shepherded this collection for many, many years and worked on it and done research on it and traveled up to uh, Dover Foxcroft to meet the people who live in the house mm -hmm. that the Hassels lived in, which is in this little pamphlet. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that these letters exist because people cared to keep them. Most of the letters relate to mother, Louise Krieger, um, and various daughters, mostly daughters, kept them, and then they were passed on to the next generation and the next generation. And Andy Jaffe and Giselle live in the Hassel House, Harry Hassel's house on Academy Hill. And when they were doing some renovations, they found more Hassel family letters tucked into the attic and the walls and closets. So it's a real treasure trip. Now, uh, Jenny's remarks. Um, Jenny wanted you to know that nearly all of the original letters are quite long. And what you hear tonight is a small edi edited version from over 90 letters from her ancestors to each other. They are dated 1850 to 1903. Most of the letters that we have were written by mother, Sarah Parker Hassel, <laughs> and the two her children. Occasionally, the sisters, brothers, cousins, and family connection clergy write to each other. <coughs> We only have one side of their conversation. She did not include any of the clergy's, that Jenny did not include any of the clergy's letters in this reading. They tended to be long-winded, she said. <laughs> Letter writing was the only means of staying connected and sharing town and family news as family members moved from the farm in Maine to Connecticut, Rhode Island, California, Montana, Washington, and finally Conway. 
this, that is why you'll be hearing a lot of write soon, write when you can, write all the news there is to print. <laughs> the letter written by George in 1866 describes a bit of chaos in the house. Louise Krieger researched the date and location in the New York Times and found that there was an exorcism on February 13, 1866. You must tell us about that afterwards. <laughs> A little bit, but I know. Yes, one letter in particular, this is the last piece, one letter in particular that you'd hear read tonight still puzzles us. And it's on display over there next to the blue colored letter. Um, it, it's not dated, it was written by Sarah and it appears to, it was written to her husband. Sarah died in 1861, and we have the impression that Sarah wrote it knowing that she was close to death, and did she write it herself? Did she dictate it to someone to give to her husband after she died? You'll have to decide. Thank you. <laughs> Dover, March 10th, 1850, to Sarah and Maria. Absent daughters, as the day has passed and the children have all retired to rest, I thought best to write you a few lines and let you know we are well. I am not sick, have not been sick one day this winter, so your fortune teller missed her guess once. You must not place much dependence on what they say. Mr. Dillingham from Augusta preached at the Universalist home house today. The society talk of hiring him to preach this summer. The sewing circle had a fair and a tea party a few weeks since, but I did not attend. I believe they did not make out so well as they did last year. I suppose you would like to have a little California news. Your father heard today that Captain Hale and crew had arrived at California and all well. Now, I suppose you will think this the best news I have written. Quite likely we shall hear all about it in a few days. If we get a letter for you, we will send it on to you if you don't come home first. Caroline Hanling died a few weeks since. She was taken with bleeding at the lungs and lived but two weeks after it. Cynthia Young has been at home this winter getting ready to be married, but has been disappointed. Her intended was Mr. Elephant of Sebec. She got about ready and the day to be published. He heard she was going to marry him for his money and then he would not have her. He is now married to his brother's intended, he being dead. <laughs> I believe I have written all the news, excepting Mr. Hurd had very sore eyes so he could not see for a good many days. You must excuse all errors and bad writing. Give my love to all inquiring friends. Write soon. Be good girls from your mother. <laughs> Dover, June 3rd, 1850, to Maria. Dear sister, I wanted to know what kind of a new bonnet you got, what the fashion <laughs> is, how you get along with your beau, and I have forgotten his name too and should like to have you refresh my memory. I told mother I would scold at you for not writing more, but I never practiced scolding on paper, and so she'll have to give it up. Uh. <laughs> Gilman was laid up again last week with a sore hand. He has got the California fever again. Thinks he shall certainly go in the fall, but I doubt it. I went to meeting and saw Gracia taken into the church with Henry, Clara, Abby, Marvilla Page, Helen Layton, Emma Ames, and Sabina Lamson. There were about 20 in the hole. I saw four baptized by immersion to join the Baptist church. We have got five little turkeys and a little pig. I believe I have written all the news, at least all I can think of, for news is a very scarce article here now. It is just four o'clock, time I was doing something about supper. We have got a real steady old horse. Now I can turn around anywhere. The greatest difficulty is that he won't go at all, but <laughs> Joe and I together can get him along very well. I have got my paper about full, and I guess you have got enough, enough of my jabber. And if you can make out to read it, you will do well. But if you don't, send it back and I will read it to you. <laughs> Be sure and write very soon. 
Write all the news and everything else you can think to write. Be sure to write soon. Mm -hmm. Sarah. <laughs> Dover, November 3rd, 1850. To Maria. Dear sister, I will now write the letter which I should have written last Sabbath if they had not forgotten to get me some paper. We are all in good health and hope this will find you enjoying the same blessing. I do not think I shall go to Lowell this fall to work for reduced wages, as I can get reduced wages enough at home. <laughs> as for going there to be married, it is most too late in the season to make it very pleasant journeying. And besides, I choose to be married at home. Sarah is expecting David, and she says, I must finish this letter. We have been to meeting today, heard a very excellent sermon. I wish you could have heard it. I think you could no longer doubt universal salvation. I believe we have not written very particularly about David and his company. He is the only one of the company that have returned. Rogers and Buck had their gold stolen, about $800 apiece. Napoleon B. Chase died in the hospital at San Francisco in the summer. He is supposed to be the one that stole Rogers and Buck's gold. Henry Parsons is married, lives in Mrs. Byram's house. Damon B. is also married, Ophelia Brockway and Mr. Gray, Mariah Brockway to a Mr. Kendall. So you see, it is quite marrying times here this fall. I believe I have written all the news. I hope you will make up your mind to go to school this winter, for I think it will be much better for you than working in the factory. Don't think you are too old or backward, but make up your mind that you will go and will be somebody. Persevere, and you may be a great lady yet. Don't always think you are behind the rest of the girls at your age. Go ahead. You are as capable of learning as they. Just make up your mind that you will. Good night from your affectionate mother and sister. Dover, December 18th, 1853. To Maria. I will now try and answer your letter. Ellen has left the mill, but sticks to Lowell. William Sampson is going to be overseer in the mill. George Frost is going to be sorting wool. Last Thursday, I began on my first batch of flannel. William says I get along well. I believe Marinda Cutter is coming into the mill to work again tomorrow. Daniel Bartlett has gone into the woods, and his wife is in the mill to work. She boards to Mr. Frost's. David has not gone into the woods yet. He will go as soon as there's some snow. George Gilman got home. He is rather slender, but is game. I will now bid you goodbye, hoping you will be as punctual as before. Gilman. Dear sister, our school has commenced and I wish it were done instead of just begun. Our teacher is real cross but I suppose she has to be. I had to sit on the f at the front of the, s the room because I laughed. <laughs> well, she's for ruled three scholars, George Sherwood, Virgil Byron, and Ellen Braun. I think likely that she shall miss her ruler. <laughs> at least I think she will. <laughs> the Universalist had a levy last Wednesday. Mother and I went. We had a very good time. They had something they called a grab bag, and everyone that took out something had to pay 10 cents. They had 20 silver thimbles in a bag. I should have grabbed if I had thought I could get one of them. Well, I will leave this now for Mother to finish. Good evening. Write soon. Be. Well, Maria. Phoebe says I must write something. In the first place, I will give you a more particular account of the levy. They had the candy stand as usual, a post office, a fortune teller, an oyster stand, and a grab bag. All did a good business and made a considerable sport. The circle ladies are making shirts for Greeley. Made one dozen in two afternoons, $175 per dozen. Sarah and Phoebe continue making them. Martha and Martha R. took a lot and spoiled them so they could not be altered. So, of course, they did not receive their full pay. They did not like that very well. 
and would not take any more. I hope you enjoy yourself this winter. Improve your time well. Do not patronize the candy shop Sundays. Excuse my bad writing and mistakes. Be a good girl. Write soon and often. Good night from your mother. Dear sisters, I thought as I could get no one else to write, rather than to not hear from you, I will write myself. Gilman says he's going to wait, as long as you did before he writes. Oh. <laughs> Sarah has not yet named her baby, yet she thinks that she shall name it Ada Maria. David feels so big he can hardly contain himself. He's afraid it will have red hair, but I guess it will not. I think it will have the color of Sarah's. I've got my shirts done and got me a plain Delane dress for 30 cents a yard. We have all together made eight dozen shirts. David bought a yoke of oxen today and gave $110 for them. But I cannot think of another word to write and I shall leave it for mother to finish. Write soon. From your sister, Phoebe. April 3rd, 1854. Well, girls, as Phoebe can think of nothing else to write, I will try and finish the page, or you will think it too short a letter to answer. Your father carried a part of our dried apples to the store and sold them for eight cents a pound. He carried 100 pounds. Mrs. Calvin Chamberlain has been very sick. Mrs. Elias Hale is quite sick, not expected to live long. Likewise, Mrs. Kendall is quite feeble. Mrs. Mayhew was here yesterday afternoon. She said they were all well. Clara Cole, or, or rather Shaw, has a boy seven weeks old. I suppose you think the baby fever rages high this winter. It certainly does. I hope I shall not catch it. I don't think there is much danger. <laughs> I hope you will both be careful what you say to the men. Don't think too much about their outward appearance. I must close. Excuse my bad writing, for my pen is very bad. Good night. Write as often as you can. From your mother, in haste. <laughs> Dover, November 19th, 1854. To Maria and Martha. Absent daughters. David has a new jacket and Sarah a new tippet, cost $8. Phoebe has just made her a new cape, wore it today for the first time, cost a little short of $3. The boys have all got some new pants. Harriet has a new Delane dress and tears. Ada, with the rest, has some new red flannel dresses. I hope you will be good girls and improve, and improve your time well. Take good care of yourselves. Don't be imprudent in any respect. Behave yourselves in such a manner that you can look back with pleasure on the past. I believe I must stop writing. The fire has gone out and I begin to grow cold. You must excuse this poor letter. Perhaps the next will be better. Write soon and often. Good night from your mother. Dover, February 4th, 1855, to Maria and Martha. Absent daughters. Gilman was here after meeting. He is well. He says I may tell you he had his fortune told, and the fortune teller told him he had some sisters away from home, and one of them was courted and would be married soon. He says you had better take your fellow home and be married when he is. He is very much taken up with his Sarah Robinson. I think it likely enough it will be a match. I have not seen her to know. Mr. Haven has sold his house to Colonel Chase. Mr. Stacy has sold his farm to Mr. White. Mr. Dearborn has sold his shop and stock to Smith Thompson. Mr. Fessenden is down flat. His creditors have turned him out of doors. So you see, the people are buying and selling and changing from one thing to another. Horace Plummer has moved to Dexter with his family. Hannah Judkins is over from Cornville. She sends her love to you. Deacon Pratt's wife is dead, also old Mr. Sprague. He was riding home on the sled, fell off and killed him. Charles, his son, was killed in California in December by the earth caving on to him. Phoebe has been at school today. She has borrowed a book of somebody and is all engaged in it. Shirt business is down. We have not had any for three weeks. I don't think they will have many more if they, they will have many more made if they don't. 
I think there must be some mistake about Joseph's going home with Mary Jane. It was nothing but Sarah's nonsense. He is the same Joseph yet. I believe I have written enough and will draw to a close. Excuse all bad writing, for I am in a hurry. Be good girls. Take good care of yourselves. Write often. Good night. From your mother. Dover, August 31st, 1856. To Maria and Edward Delabar. Dear Maria and Edward, I received your letter with pleasure. Would gladly visit you this fall if I could, but your father thinks it is not possible for us to. Do not be disappointed and say you will not come home again until we have been there. I should go if I could. We are all well. There is not much news but politics. Almost everybody is engaged in politics. There was two political meetings to the village last week. Jason and mother were up to Sarah's. I went over and took care of the babies for them to go hear the Republican Governor Anson Morrill, Republican, speak. They were very much pleased. It was a Fremont meeting. I must write afterwards to your husband respecting the farm. Mr. Thompson will sell his farm for $2,000. There has been a man to look at it and thinks he shall buy it if he can sell his. If you wish to buy the farm, you can have it by letting him know soon. David says he would like to swap with you if you should buy it and let you have his if that would suit you as well. Please write soon as you get this, as Mr. Thompson wishes to know immediately. With respect from your mother. Dover, November 19th, 1856, to Maria. Dear Maria, as Sarah thinks she cannot write this week, I will try and write a few lines thinking you would feel disappointed if you did not hear from one of us. I have had so much to do and to think of lately, I have neglected writing until now. I hope you will not think hard of me. I am not much of a letter writer, you know. We miss Joseph and Phoebe very much. I had a letter from him when he was in New York. He said he was not sorry he started and was not homesick. Poor boy. Knows but little about the world or about wickedness and deceitfulness of man. He has got much to learn. It will be a hard and perhaps a good lesson for him if he has his health and is prospered as many are. It will be better for him than to always stay at home and dig for a little or nothing. I hope for the best. We get along very well with the work. The little boys work like men. They fetch all the water for me, Appleton does the milking, and your father takes care of the hogs. So you see, I have got rid of all those hard pieces of work I used to do. Next week is Thanksgiving. Here we have got our turkey shut up to fatten. I wish I could send you a turkey. You wish to know how long it would take to roast one. It will take about three hours, cooked moderately. It is better than to hurry it. For stuffing, take a cracker or two, turn some hot water, and then let them soak until soft, and then break an egg into it. Put in pepper, salt, and butter. Stir them all together on the stove. Do not add much water, only enough to soak the bread soft. Pieces of flour bread will answer very well instead of crackers. It is now bedtime, and I must stop writing. And I think I will say I am glad of it, for I cannot read what you have written. Give my love to your husband and be a good girl and write soon from your mother. July 15th, 1858 to Mar Maria. I have been to meeting today. I'm pretty tired, but I suppose that's no excuse for not writing. We went strawberrying yesterday afternoon and got two quarts of real nice ones. Don't it just make your mouth water? I was down to temperance meeting last night, had a very good meeting. We have a new password. Oh, I can't think of more to write, so I will leave it for your mother to finish. <laughs> Give my love to you, to all, and write soon, Aunt Susan. Maria, you wanted to know if I was well now as when you left. I think I am, but don't do any more work. I believe I grow lazy. The little boys have got some new coats and I have got them made. Appleton's is brown and George's is blue. I suppose you will not like it because they are not jackets. But the tailor said coats were the most fashionable and father thought that was right. I felt somewhat disappointed but tried to make the best of it. 
They have not been to meeting yet. George has no shoes. I shall make them some vests this week. By the time they get fairly rigged for summer, it will be cold weather. Phoebe is going to carry this to the office tonight, so I must close. Write soon from your mother. June 1858 to Hattie. Dear Hattie, what are you going to do with your money? 28 cents is a good deal for a little girl. Industry has its reward, and you will get rich sometime if you persevere. I think your dress must be a new fashion, for it was invisible to my eye. I hope it is not so to everyone. <laughs> do not think I shall like it if it is. It must be that you did not send me a piece of it, or I did not see it in a letter. I suppose you will be glad when school begins. Ada is rather mischievous to scratch and bite, and I hope you did not set her the example. I think Phoebe is smart to get her great washing done by ten, but I suppose you helped her some. It is getting dark, and I must close. Write soon. Martha. Blackstone, April 21st, 1859, to Hattie. Dear Hattie, as you wished me to write to you, I will try to gratify your wish. I am here with Maria. She looks good and appears the same as usual. We had a pretty hard ride to Newport on account of the snow and mud, but had good company, which made the time pass more pleasantly than it would otherwise have done. Mr. Sawyer and another gentleman were full of stories. Daniel Vaughan was in company with us. He had to get out of the stage with, with the other gentleman twice and walk through the mud. We did not get muddy, not much wet our veils, and umbrellas protected us from the snow. The horses went so slow so the mud could not fly. We started from Dexter about four o'clock and arrived at Newport about 15 minutes before the cars were ready for us. We all stood the journey much better than I expected. I must stop writing for it is almost dark and Gilman wants to carry this to the office tonight. Write me all about the work and how Martha gets along making butter. Tell father it cost me eight dollars and a half to get here. Good night from mother. Dover, December 10th, 1859. To Appleton. Dear Appleton, I suppose you are looking for a letter from home this week, and if you are anxious for it as we were to receive yours, it will be received with pleasure, even if it does not contain much news. Next, the next Saturday after you left, we had a snowstorm. The snow fell to the depth of one foot. The next Wednesday night, we had another storm and blow. Thursday, the roads were all blocked up. It took about a day and a half to break them out. Today, it is cold. The wind is out east. I think we are going to have a storm. Your father and David butchered their hogs last Wednesday. Your father sold his hog to Mr. Payne. It weighed 322 pounds. Wow. David will carry his to Bangor when it comes suitable, becomes suitable going. Mrs. Mayhew had her butchering done yesterday. <clears throat> Uncle Nathaniel died last Wednesday and was buried Friday. The rest of the friends were all well. You must write often from mother. Dear brother, it is Sunday afternoon, it is snowing like everything. I guess you will think we have snow enough, but this is the third snowstorm we have had since you went away. We have a good school this winter. I wish you was here to go, so we write in school. Yesterday afternoon, I killed the two roosters. One of them I had to stick three times before you would die. Well, Ab, it is getting so dark I cannot see, so I shall have to close. Goodbye, write soon from your brother, George Hassel. <laughs> Musa, January 22nd, 1860. To Sister Harriet. Dear sister, I received your letter last Thursday evening and was very glad to hear from home and hope you and George will try and write something as often as you possibly can. For I assure you that I am glad enough to get anything that comes from home. I should have liked some of your parched corn and apples that you had at your party, and should like to have been there to help you eat them. I miss the apples very much, 
and just begin to appreciate the worth of them. I go to writing school now. It commenced last Wednesday evening. There were about 16 scholars in all. Some of them write and some study arithmetic. It is kept by the man that keeps the day school. His name is Mr. Hall. He keeps 20 nights for 50 cents and we have to furnish our own lights and writing materials. I went last Tuesday. I like weaving very well. I take of about a cut a day now when I have good work, which brings me about 85 cents and a dollar. It is now almost dark and I shall have to close, so goodbye. Right soon, Appleton. Musa. February 16th, 1860, to Hattie. Dear Hattie, I suppose you will expect a letter this week, but I doubt it's being a very good one, or one to your mind. We are all well, excepting some have colds. Maria has quite a pretty babe. It is good-natured and fat. App is getting along well at the mill. Had earned over $73 when I came here. Gilman had a letter from Joe this last mail. He writes that he has been sick with the boils and not able to do anything for three weeks, had got better and was able to do some light work. George has left California and gone to New Orleans. When I was coming from Boston here, I saw the young ladies and boys skating on the pond. One little girl was learning. She could not stand and would fall over as soon as she attempted to stand. You must be a good girl and take good care of everything from mother. To Appleton, Dover, April 1st, 1860. Dear brother, as it has been some time since I wrote to you, I will try and write a few lines. Perhaps they will not be very interesting, as I am not much a writer. We have got one calf three weeks old today, and one lamb, most three weeks old. That is all we have had. I have tapped 22 trees this spring. I have made four quarts of syrup, and have got two pans full that is not quite boiled down. I'm going to make some sugar this week, and if you will come home, you may have just as much as you want to eat. All the wood we got up, we got up in a day and a half. And I am so lazy, I don't know as I shall ever get it chopped. <laughs> Sarah wrote that sentence, and I suppose she judges other folks by herself. David put Father's colt in the sleigh last Friday. It went first rate. My colt looks pretty well this spring. I am very much obliged to you for them oranges you sent me. Mother brought home some apples from Reading. They was nice. Father was very much pleased with that money you sent him. I cannot think of anything else to write, so I will close. Goodbye. Write soon from your brother, George Hassel. Dover, August 19, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, I received your letter last week with pleasure. I was feeling a little anxious about you and thinking you might be sick. You ask me how we all get along. I will say about the same as usual. My health is good, better than when you left. I am done making cheese. Father gets along well with his work. He has got his grain most harvested. As to the cistern, I hear nothing about it, nor do I see any signs of one. We had a fine rain last Tuesday. It has changed the face of nature surprisingly. It had become very dry before. It has not raised our springs any. David has come here for his water. Our currants are not all gone. Mrs. Rockwell had some to make jelly of. I have made eight pounds and one half of sugar into jelly. It is nice. Sarah has made some. The apples are getting to be good and plenty. Some of the limbs of the trees touch the ground they are loaded so full. And some limbs we have propped up fearing they would break down. Good night from Mother. September 2nd, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, I received your letter last Wednesday and was really glad to hear from you and glad to hear you express your feelings. We are all very well and getting along with our work about the same as usual. We have quilted another quilt and think of quilting one more before cold weather. I suppose you have heard that David has heard bad news from George R. He died in Jackson, Mississippi with the chills and typhoid fever. The letter stated he came home there in a destitute state and wanted work. The man employed him and he worked two days driving ox team and was taken sick with chills, was sick two weeks and the fever set in. 
He died in 30 minutes. It was with difficulty he could speak David's name. I think it possible he might have lost all his money and got discouraged and sick and thought he would try and get home again, but we don't know. Well, Martha, you see I have written most two sheets of paper, but it does not seem to amount to much. And if I have written anything you do not like, you must consider my imperfections, as you know I have many. I hope I shall have a good long letter from you, as I am deprived of hearing. I take a good deal of comfort in reading and answering your letters, as it is the only way I can converse with you. From your affectionate mother. Dover, September 16, 1860. To Martha. Dear Martha, I suppose you will expect a letter from home this week, but I rather doubt your getting a very long one, as I do not seem to have any ideas to write today. I had a letter from Joseph last week. He inquired after you and Phoebe, said you had better stay at home if you had not gone until he came home. He says he thinks some of coming next spring, but don't know certain. He was well. There does not seem to be any news but politics stirring. The Republicans are rejoicing in their success for governor. They have a majority of about 25,000. They have formed a company and style themselves the Wide Awakes. They march through the principal streets with torchlights carried over their heads with a band of music. Their light is a candle set in a glass lantern. Sarah and Hattie went down to see them last Thursday evening. Esquire Rice made a speech. He is chosen <coughs> senator to Congress. The Douglas party turned out with a pumpkin scraped out and a face cut in it with a candle in it. They style themselves the True Blues. We are going to commence drying apples this week. Last Thursday was quite a windy day and a great many apples blew off. George picked up three bushels under the great tree. David thinks he shall have 50 bushels, and I guess he will have more. You spoke of the cistern. I don't know, but we shall have one. There seems to be some sign, but I hear nothing said. I will let you know when it is, when it is completed. There has been an auction to the village most every night for two weeks. Father bought Hattie some sleeve buttons, gave 25 cents for them. George bought 50 envelopes for 4 cents and 4 dozen shirt buttons for 4 cents and a choir of paper for 5 cents. Father bought a lot of fancy soap and a razor and strap. I believe I have written all the news and must stop to get supper. <laughs> Write soon from your mother. To Mark Dover, September 23rd, 1860. My dear daughter, I received a few lines from you in which you said you should like to have me write. I suppose you want to know how that cistern gets along. Well, it is more of a job than I expected. To get the materials and the man to make it and cost more. It is to be built of brick. I have got the materials. Captain Jones was here last week to work up on it. I expect he will finish the truck work tomorrow. Then as soon as I can get Mr. Breeze to come and cement the inside of it, it will be done. All but the lead pipe and pump that I shall get soon, as I can get the money to spare. It will cost about $20. I think it will answer the purpose first rate. I don't know what your mother will think about it. She has not mentioned it but twice to me since she was here. I hope you are enjoying yourself, and I trust you are conducting yourself with as much propriety as I have always been informed you have when home. Your mother and Harriet has gone to a meeting this afternoon to hear a spiritualist medium preach. I don't know as there is any news that would be interesting to you. Last Thursday night and Friday we had a fine rain, but the ground was so dry it ain't started the springs yet. You think we had about 300 bushels of apples. When I have more time, perhaps I shall write more. We are all well and eat apples tremendously. Be careful of your health. If you don't like it in Blackstone, you'd better come home and go and work for Mr. D. I, with many good wishes for your good health and prosperity, remain your father, B. Hassel. Dover, September 30th, 1860. To Martha. Dear Martha, we have been having cold and unpleasant for the week past and some rain last night. The water froze in the tubs a quarter of an inch thick. We are all well and full of work. As you know, it is a busy time of year. We have been cutting apples for two weeks, have peeled 10 bushels, and, and shall have to peel a great many more. 
Your father has sold the first row of trees next to the road to Mr. Evans for $50. Our cistern is most done. We shall have the pump put in as soon as it will be dry enough to fill. I think it will make my work much easier. I believe I have written all the news and must stop and get supper. I am going to write to Joseph if I have time. Take good care of yourself and keep up good spirits. Think you are of some consequence in this world. Write soon from mother. Dover, October 14th, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, at your request I will try and write you a few lines, but possibly you may not get three cents worth from them. We are all well, and over head and ears in work. You know it is a busy time of year and a great many things to be seen to before snow comes. We finished picking apples yesterday. We had about 200 bushels. We are going to have some cider made this week, I expect, and I am going to make some applesauce. Corn is pretty good, and we have got, not got it all husked. Potatoes turned out well and are good. I think we shall have some heavy rains before long to raise our springs. Our cistern is ready to fill, but we have not got the pump in. We have frequent rains for a few weeks past, but not enough to raise the springs. Mr. Gray's barn blew down. She and her children were there alone. She was just out to feed her pig. I hope you will take good care of your health, as that is our first endeavor to protect it. Write soon from mother. Dover, October 28, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, we have water in our cistern and a pump at the sink. <laughs> we find it very handy, but have not had it long enough to feel its full convenience. It cost $20.50. The children and I went over and helped Mrs. Rockwell pare apples last Tuesday evening. They are coming over here one evening this week. We have peeled 18 bushels and have got as many more to peel. Hattie has got two new dresses. I got Eliza to cut and help make one of them. It is open, made open in front, and plain waisted, trimmed with buttons. It was 25 cents per yard. I will send you a piece. She begins to feel as though she was a great girl, and she is. She can wear your dresses without any alteration. She is not very ambitious. <laughs> Write soon from mother. <laughs> Dover, November 11th, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, it is rather an unpleasant day. The wind blows cold. We had quite a rain last night, and it has been looking like rain all day. We are all well and getting along about the same as usual. I guess your dream won't come to pass. Your father had a letter from Joe last mail and is answering it today. Joe writes that he is well and thinks he shall start home in February, but may possibly stay another year as the fare is high and he has lost some money since he got there. Sabbath Eve, your, your, uh, Sabbath Eve father and your father and David have gone to hear Mr. Hemingway again. He is still lecturing here. David says he thinks he is a true prophet and the world is soon to end. I suppose he is trying to get up an excitement and probably will and likely have many followers, but believing as he does as it respects the end of the world will not make them any better unless they have a heart to practice good works. I think we can know but very little about a person's true character by their preaching and prayers. If their life is given to good deeds, we may expect they have a Christian spirit. There is a great deal of deception in the world. I see much that passes for religion that is mere dross in my view. I enjoy goodness in any form, but hypocrisy I despise in anyone. I suppose you have heard of the probable result of Lincoln's <coughs> election. I expect there will be great doings among the wide awakes this week. I suppose there will be great rejoicing among them. Your father sold one of his cows the next week after you left, and he has traded away his old horse and two pair of steers for a young horse. It is kind and handy, but has never been used but little. I wrote to Joe last mail. We have not heard from him for three mails. Hattie is going to carry this to the office this afternoon, and I must stop writing. And I suppose you are glad of it, for I think what I have written does not amount to much, and I don't know as you can read it. <laughs> Write soon, Mother. Dover, December 16, 1860, to Martha. Dear Martha, I received your letter Thanksgiving Day with pleasure just before we sat down to dinner. Sarah and her family were here. 
We did not have a turkey, but we had chickens, pudding, mince, apple, and pumpkin pies. The day passed pleasantly as usual. We have not done our butchering yet. Expect to kill a cow and two hogs this week. Last week we killed 20 chickens. Mary Tower has another son. I hope she is not suffering and starving as we hear that many are in Kansas. I suppose you have heard the times there are extremely sad. How are the times in Blackstone? Has this political excitement affected business there? I suppose it has in many places. It is a pity that people will be governed so much by politicians who are ever seeking for office that they may live upon the republic. If they will heed to the president's message and be guided by his counsel, times will soon be better. South Carolina is taking a very wrong course in my view and one that will lead to her downfall. In the end, she will have to be sorry after it is too late. Good night, right when you feel like it, from mother. Dover, January 20th, 1861, to Martha. Dear Martha, I received your letter yesterday. It was really good to hear from you. We have got our butchering and dirt work done. David killed his hogs week before last and carried them to Bangor. They brought him over $95. They were very fat. I'm glad you went to hear Mr. Beecher. I should like to hear him, but never expect to. If I could get more of his writing to read, I should be glad. He is, I think he is one of the greatest writers of the day. His opinion of South Carolina agrees with mine. I think those wicked people will not be suffered to destroy so good a government as ours. They have done what no foreign power would dare to have done. I consider them traitors as much as Benedict Arnold was, and there will no better fate await them. The thought of war seems dreadful, but if they must fight, I shall be glad when it is over with but I think it will never cause friendship between the states, but the government must be protected. You see, I have filled my paper, but it, is, it does not amount to much. I am too deaf to hear news if there is any. Write soon. Good night, from Mother. To my husband, Benjamin Hassel. Dear husband, I am glad that you have interest for writing, for as a spirit I have long been, it seems to me, been away from you. You cannot see me, I know, but I cannot help that. I am in the form more of the spirit, that is, I do live in a state you cannot seem to understand. I am with you very often now. I try to make myself known to you. Last night I stood by the side of your bed. I could not make you know I was there except as to make you think of me in your dream. Oh, my husband, my dear husband, and my dear children, all of them, how much I have wished I could talk with you since I have been here. I am happy, yes, quite, and am, and am increasing, I think, in the knowledge of the bright world. Give my love to all my children and friends. Tell Sarah I can tell her much more now I have some time. Phoebe is well, or was, yesterday afternoon. I don't know hardly what I can say to make you know it is the wife and companion of your youth writing to you. It is I. I told you once, you were sitting near where you do now. I should leave you alone, and then you would see how you could get along. I am happy now. Oh, husband, be you happy now? If you are not, do be so. I am. I know you are not. You are worrying me much. Take the world easy now. I am your wife still, and love you as I used to. Do be contented. I think I cannot write any more now. I was not much of a writer. My love to you all, Sarah Hassel. Blackstone, April 4th, to Brother Appleton. Dear Brother, I was very much pleased indeed to receive a letter from you. I think you must be ashamed of me for I've heard nothing about the Copperhead Society. I think it is high time something be done to put down the rebellion. But as long as so much disunion exists amongst the people, so long we must have, ever have trouble and strife. 
I think there ought to be a few more genuine peacemakers in the world. If each individual would strive to put down the rebellion in his own heart, it would not take long for this nation to be healed. I hope you will write me again soon. Now, be a good boy and tell me about your school, composition, declamations, etc. Your sister, Martha. Moosuk, June 7th, 1863, to Appleton. Dear brother, it is Sunday morning and a pretty rainy one it is, but I do not think that will do any hurt, for the ground is getting very dry. But I would rather it would rain some other day, for it is pretty lonesome here when it rains. Mrs. Jones is not dead yet. She is alive and well as ever. Mr. Hill's store was broken open last Thursday night. They stole some money and goods. I do not know how much. They have arrested Smith Hall for it. I do not know whether he is guilty or not. Jim Barnes' wife and Mr. Sullivan's wife got to fighting a week ago last night. Sullivan's wife struck Jim Barnes' wife on the head with a stick and cut a pretty bad gash on it. <laughs> and they had her arrested for it. Well, uh, my paper is full, and I will stop writing and go to the office with it. Right soon, from George. Musa, July 19th, 1863, to Appleton. Dear brother, it is Sunday afternoon, it has just begun to rain, but I guess it will not rain much. I did not get a letter from Martha last week. I did not know whether that the mill has started up or not. I have received a letter from Phoebe last Monday. There is no work there for me. Do you think I would go if there was? I have just been out huckleberry. I picked all I wanted to eat. They are pretty thick. Has Thomas Rockwell got his discharge, or is he going back again? Well, Ap, ain't you afraid you will be drafted? They have not drafted here yet. They say they're going to tomorrow. I do not feel much afraid of it. I cannot think of anything more to write. So we'll stop and carry this letter to the post office. Goodbye, write soon, George. Folio, October 31st, 1865, to George. Dear Brother George, I received your letter last night. Was very glad indeed to hear from you, and very glad indeed that you had made a change for the better. I do hope that you will not have to go back on that receiving ship. Have not heard from Appleton since I last wrote you. Don't see what has become of him. Should think he would write if he was in Philadelphia. I'm afraid he's sick. Should have thought they would have let you go on board of the vessel. It would not have hurt the stingy scamps. It is not, it is not best for them ever to cross my path. I've got one of the new company warps. It goes first rate, can make over a dollar and a half a day. By the way, I almost forgot to tell you, Phoebe is going to be married soon. About Thanksgiving, I expect. Wish you could come home before she goes off. Probably will in a week or two. Who knows? But you will be discharged by then and come home to take her place. Wish it could be so. I cannot write any more tonight, as it is late, and I have to get up early to make breakfast. I will send you a paper. You must write soon. You are always wishing, um, we are always wishing to hear from you. Good night. Write soon. Affectionately, your sister, Martha. Philadelphia, February 8th, 1866. To Hattie. Dear sister, I received your letter yesterday morning with the greatest of pleasure, and I now take my pen to write you a few lines. This will be the last letter I shall write to you at present, for I am going into Bienville. I expect to go on board sometime next week. I do not know where she is going. You may think of me the last of this month as being in a warm country 
where such a thing as snow is thought of. I wish I was there now, away from the cold weather. You need not be surprised if you did not hear from me again for three or four months. Have you heard of the haunted house here in Philadelphia? There is great excitement here about it. Last Thursday, three young ladies retired to bed, and they hear a noise in their room. And looking, they saw their headdresses and combs thrown upon the floor. They got up and placed them on the bureau when they were again thrown upon the floor. They then called their father, and mirrors and pictures commenced to fly around the room. When they set the table in the morning, the plates were thrown upon the floor and broken. They had to take their breakfast from their laps that morning. One of the servants was washing the dishes at the sink, and one of the tumblers flew up and struck her in the forehead and cut a gash there. The family were very much frightened and moved their things from the house to keep them from being broke. Some of them think it is evil spirits there. Well, Hattie, I will leave off writing. You need not write again until you hear from me. Goodbye, your brother, George A. Hassel. USS Bienville, Aspinwall, June 10th, 1866. To Martha. Dear sister, I now take my pen and seat myself to write you a few lines, but it has been so long since I have written a letter, I have almost forgotten how to. I have been to eight different places since I have been out. I expect to stop here two months, and then I suppose we shall go back to St. Thomas or some other of the West Indies Islands. I like it out here first rate. Fruit is very cheap here. I expect to grow fat here eating fruit. I do not like this place as well as I do St. Thomas, for it rains here every day. There has been only one dry day since I have been here, and I do not expect to see another one while I am here. I should like to get my discharge here and go to California, for I am nearer there now than I ever expect to be again. I went ashore one night last month to a fire in Mayaquez. There were about 100 buildings burned. The men ashore did not try to put it out, but just stood and looked on and see it burn. If it had not been for the sailors, very near the whole town would have been burned. We could get anything we wanted for nothing after the fire. They would not take money from us after we put the fire out. We had great times after we got aboard. The men were most all drunk. Some of them we had to bring on board, they were so drunk. Others commenced fighting when they got back. We had great times for the rest of that day. <laughs> well, Martha, I believe I have written all I can think, so I will close by bidding you goodbye. Write soon. From your brother, George A. Hassel. Please to write as soon as you get this, for I may not be here long. Direct your letter to George A. Hassel, USS Bienville, Aspinwall, New Grenada. Charleston, Illinois, April 25, 1877. To Uncle Benjamin Hassel. Dear Uncle, many thanks for your kind letter. It does me so much good to hear direct from you. You will never be so old that a letter from your own hand will not always be a welcome messenger. The country is looking finely. Our yard is full of fruit trees, and they are full of blossoms and very fragrant. I have not heard from Aunt Susan for some time, not from California for a long time. I do not have any good success with the letters sent there. I've had one sent back to me. Uncle, I want you to write to me as often as you can, and tell Martha I hope she will sometime forgive her unworthy cousin. And if anything should happen to any of you, which God forbid, I hope she will write me. My love to all the cousins, with a large share to you, Uncle, from your niece, Clara Gage. Forest Ranch, Chico Butte Company, August 20th, 1877. To Uncle Benjamin Hassel and Conway. My dear uncle, your kind favor in response to my last was duly received, and after some delay, I attempt to reply, although I fear my effort will not be very entertaining. My health was not good at all all spring, and about the middle of May, David moved me to the mountains, and I have been spending the summer with Louise, 17 miles north of Chico, enjoying the mountain scenery and cold spring water. I walk a mile occasionally and pass a pleasant day with a friend. 
greatly do enjoy the mountain scenery amongst the tall pines, cedars, and firs with the mingling of the sturdy oak maple. Louise is living on a beautiful piece of about a hundred yards from a hotel where on average not less than 60 horses put up for the night, mostly freight and lumber teams. Last year, Marshall and his two brothers rented and run a sawmill here and did very well. The timber here was so large it makes for heavy work at the mills. Our nephew, Will Campbell, who returned to Iowa at the request of his mother last fall, is coming back. He writes he is thoroughly sick of Iowa. The winters are too long and too cold for him and business too slow. I don't know whether his family come or not. Now I will try to explain something I did not make very clear in my former letter. The flume is sort of a canal made out of boards from floating lumber. The one that comes to Chico starts near the summit of the Sierra Mountains and runs about 40 miles. It runs through or crosses um, canyons and sometimes is supported by trestle work of various heights. In one instance, not far from here, it is 120 feet high. The main descent is so great that the water runs very rapidly. We are living near the brow of a canyon, which by a descent of a thousand feet in one half mile, we come to a ranch where they have a great quantity of fine fruit, among other things. I had the curiosity to go down recently and am delighted with my visit. The good man had the kindness to let me ride up on his pack horse, he leading it through the narrow winding passages. Seldom anyone rides down. It was surprising to see how much a man can tie on a mule and bring up for market. David joins me in affectionate remembrance of you. We're glad to hear of your continued good health. May it long continue. We shall hope to hear from you soon and often. Well, my cousins, accept my love and kind wishes. Your most affectionate niece, M. N. Campbell direct to Chico Butte Company, California. Foxcroft, Maine, June 28, 1878. Uh, to Hattie. Dear Hattie, I received your letter a short time ago and will try to answer it. Did you know George and Wallace had gone off? They started last Monday morning for Washington Territory. It will take them three weeks to get there if they have good luck. There are good ways from home for George to try to make his luck, although it doesn't seem so bad for him as it does for Wallace with the family. I think if a man is going to be so far, he better go off before he has a wife and a child to leave. Abby has gone home. He says he'll send for her if he does well. Isn't he kind? <laughs> I think he would, he says, um, I think he would work pretty hard to make a living on my farm before I would go so far. And I think Oscar would, but I guess he likes hard work better than Wallace does. You know, that makes some difference in the world. Bet they went when they could and went and they wanted to and had got what they wanted if they could get it. Well, I guess I should stop right to write any more. I want to go out and get some plums before I have to make pies this morning. Write soon. I wish you were here to go out with me from Cousin Ada. Snohomish, Washington Territory. July 11, 1883, to Martha. Dear sister, I presume you have been looking for a letter for me for some time, but I haven't seemed to get about it. Now I will try. You will see that I have got away in one corner of the world at last. Have been here five weeks today. Had a very pleasant journey and arrived safe and well. Was three weeks and three days on the way. 
stopped one week in San Francisco and one day in Seattle. It was four days from Frisco to Seattle. I liked Seattle quite well. It is a very growing place. A great deal of building going, being done there and some nice ones. Rent is $20 a month for anything that would do to live in, so I am here with Abby for the present in the woods about three quarters of a mile from town. If we conclude to stop here, we shall have to build us a house. There is plenty of work here, a great country for lumbering, but the emigration here has been very large this season. Snohomish is a small place on the banks of the Snohomish River. One church, one schoolhouse, three stores, and a nice hall and a Masonic hall, and I don't know how many inhabitants. Quite a pretty little place, but to me, there is no place like home. But there are a great many people here from the east, and I haven't seen any, anybody yet that would go back to live if they could. But I should be glad to, if I could have my home back again, and my family all with me. But, as it is, I don't know as it makes much difference with me. I never expect to be very happy anywhere. Let me go where I will, there is something wanting. It is hard to have one's family and home broken up and feel that you have no home in the wide world. Well, our spring has failed up and we have to carry our water a long ways. But there is a brook near the house that does to wash with. Tell Hat it is a good place to raise hens. She can go into that business. Eggs now are 35 cents, and in the winter, they are 75. You can build a good house here for $700, and a good many build even cheaper than that, and still they look well. They had a celebration here the 4th, and a dress ball in the evening, though I did not go. I did think of going in to see their dresses, but it was so far. Some had dresses that cost $100. So, you see, they dress here a little. Have you heard from Joe? I wrote to him when I was in Frisco, but he don't answer it. Direct to Snohomish City, in the care of C.H. Davis. There are so many Andersons here, it is a very common name. I don't want to lose my letters. Your sister, Sarah. Snohomish, May 25th, 1884. To Martha. Dear sister, your letter was received in due time and having a few leisure moments, I will try and write a little bit. We are all well, except Abby. She is in bed with her little son, five days old, and both doing nicely. George is up on his farm this summer, putting in a little crop, and clearing up for a bigger one next year. A great many are taking up land, and I think that it is about as good a paying business as there is here now. I don't think you would like this country very well. It looks too rough and new. I am going up to George's farm next month to see how it looks. It is a rough road through the woods, but I must see it someday, so I am going up to camp out a few days. They have bears and wildcats, cougars and deer up there. How would you like to go? Oh, I wish it could be my lot to live where I could have all my children around me, but that cannot be. I have got to give it up and live along as best I can. Well. My paper is about full, and it is dinner time, so I shall have to stop. I would have been just as well if I had before I began, as I don't seem to have much to write. Please give my love and best wishes to all, and write soon. Sarah. Snohomish, November 5th, 1885. To Martha. Dear sister, Yours of September was received in due time, and I thought I would sit right down and answer, but kept putting it off, but will do so no longer. I will write it, but can't tell when I will get a chance to send it. I have penetrated the wilderness too far to suit you. I think you would not be happy away from civilized life very long. Where I am now, meanings are unknown. The butcher or the grocer never calls. Still, I get it enough to eat such as it is. I couldn't eat better if I could get it. Fred went out and got four great salmon for the hens yesterday. They are very plenty here. Scott would have a good time fishing. They have done nothing about the iron mine yet, and probably won't in my day. There has been quite a lot in here looking for a gold mine. 
There are some men digging not far from here now. They sent some of the rock away to be assayed. They sent back that the indications were good and not to neglect digging past here, uh, digging into it, and so they have gone to it, but I don't have much faith in it. They go right past here to get to it, and it is but a few miles. If it should prove good, it would be a good thing for us all, but I don't believe that it will. Don't excite me at all, though. The ones that are drunk on it have great faith, but our boys don't think enough of it to make up a claim yet. It is very good of you to send me so many papers, and I feel very grateful. It has been a pleasure for me, for I love to read and know what is going on in the world. I do not see much, and I don't get out much. I have time to read, so please accept my thanks. Hope to hear from you soon. Sarah. I have not heard from Joe since I have been out here. Harriet married Augustus Chandler, a widower, a widower with two children. February 7th, 1887, to Martha. Dear Martha, I didn't have a chance to send a letter last week, but can get yours. It is a beautiful day. I've been up to Sarah's and got, been up to Ada's and got Sarah. She took dinner with us and is now washing the dishes while I write. We are going to town this afternoon, and I want to get started in good season. What do I mean? Well, Martha, just this. I'm in a home of my own. I went to the Parsons Saturday evening and got spliced. It was hard of me to think of giving up my own home but there, but Martha, I could not go anywhere where I am more welcome than here, not even back in Conway. After I get fixed up, I shall have a pleasant home. There's a great deal to do, for now everything is in disrepair and out of order. Tell Louise George I wish she was here to help me fix my daughter, for I do not know how. She is 11 years old, the boy 17. They are both pleased with me, and I think it was better for me to be here than to work in the mills. Augustus Chandler is not a handsome man, but he's a good one. <coughs> I will write more, but I haven't time. We'll write again soon. I want my machine as soon as I can. I suppose I shall have some sewing to do. Goodbye. I shall expect to hear from you this week. Harriet E. Hassel Chandler, Boxcroft, Maine, Box 73. Foxcroft, April 15th, to Harriet, out uh, to Martha. Dear Martha, as Saturday was stormy, I did not get your letter till yesterday, and hardly knowing what to write till I did here. It storms today, so I fear that it will not get to the office. While we went to the congregational minister, Mr. Morehouse, I did not like him very well. I do not know whether Augustus is a Christian or not, but he is a good man. Have had no trouble cooking, yet they are su the su surprised that I do so well. We're going to have the house fixed in the spring, have indulged in a bit of an extravagance. A man here came, came here with smuggled goods. He had silver knives and forks. I saw they had a true ring, and he let me have them at a bargain threw in some teaspoons, a dozen of them. So I took them and I used them every day. Well, I had to have something very soon and it was just as cheap as to buy steel ones. Goodbye and write as soon as you can. Love to Maddie and the boys. Harriet Elizabeth Hassel Chandler. Hassel, Montana. October 6, 1903, to Joe Hassel in Conway. Friend Joe, well, Joe, do you suppose you can ever forgive me for my action in Townsend on your last day? Try and do so. I was so darn busy drinking whiskey, I was unable to think of anything else. <laughs> you know how it is, Joe, so don't think too hard of me, and I'll promise it'll never happen again. Today's been the first day since the dance that I've been able to think. 
my brains, what little I've got, seem to have been misplaced in the wrong part of my head. <laughs> but it's all right now. Well, Joe, I hope you had a good trip, and that by the time this reaches you, you are safely home with your sister. No change in the camp, whatever, since you left. No one started to do anything in the pack, and I'm afraid it's his failure. Let's hear from you, Joe, and tell us how you are getting on in the flies. Truly, your friend, Otto Albrecht. Silver Wave Mine, November 6, 1903, to Joe Hassel. Friend Joe, your letter of October 23rd came to hand a few days ago. I'm certainly glad to hear from you, and I'm glad to hear that you are improving in health. You certainly must have had a great time by the way you speak in your letter. I would not mind having a time like it myself for a while, even if I had to wear a stiff collar and use finger bowls. <laughs> I know what you say about gaining 12 pounds. It seems to me that if you keep up, that you'll have to buy a larger buggy when you return. Blue is still at work and got his shaft down 125 feet when he was drowned out. This, as a matter of course, stopped all underground work. They put up a hoist and were lowering the pumps yesterday. Hoist a second hand, they're having a hard time to get started. They tell me the engine is put together from half a dozen different engines. They paid nearly $500 freight on this machinery. But taking a little more money, they would have bought a good hoist in Montana. A daily mail has been reestablished from Townsend to Hassel. I paid $30 last night for six loads of wood. I shall buy no more wood because this wood cost me $6.50 a core. You will see by the papers that I send you that the anaconda mines, smelters, sawmills, coal mines have closed down. This will affect in the neighborhood of 30,000 people directly and indirectly, and will make hard times in Montana. We've been having fine weather for over a month. There was no snow here yet. Well, Joe, I hope and am inclined to think that you will become a new man before this winter is over. With kind of regards to all the girls you meet, I am E.O. Albrecht. Ira Band, Kate Whitcomb, Kathy Otterman Lamas, <laughs> Bob Lamas, and Louise Krieger. <laughs> <laughs>